Hello, everybody. Welcome to the next class on Fuchsian differential equations. So <clears throat> here in Austria, it's already late afternoon. Those who are listening from the US, it's morning. And there are also some, <coughs> some people from Japan. So I hope they don't fall asleep. But they can also see it, of course, in the recording. So the recording of the classes are on our website. And they should be available always on Wednesday after the class, but not in the early morning, because we have to cut first the video, and then we have to put it online. But <clears throat> in the late afternoon, it should be ready for everybody. So welcome to today's class. Those I see in the audience that there are several experts of the field of Fuchs and differential equations who know much better than I do the field. So uh, for those, it will be a little bit boring today because we do the basics. We just do the, the main terminology and we prove some very simple lemmata to get started. Okay. Uh, and I'm a little bit in, in delay with the notes, but I hope to, to send you or to put on the website the notes of some details we cannot prove here. Uh, this should complement our class. So <clears throat> I'm also very pleased by the positive feedback some of you gave me. I'm always happy to get an email or a message. So I think we can start. Let's see if we are approximately complete. Yeah. So let me call it just basics. And uh, so we can have several levels of generality. For the moment, at the time being, I will mostly work over the complex numbers with holomorphic functions. Yeah? But you could also think of a, a different field or just formal power series or Puiseux series. You could even think of a field of positive characteristic. So this is most often included, but I will not denote it separately. Okay? So we will have a ring of functions, and I just denote it by O. So this O shall mean either <coughs> holomorphic functions in C at 0. So this will mean that local <coughs> in a neighborhood of 0. So you can identify this with the ring of convergent power series. We are always in one variable, uh, which is included in the formal power series. We could also do everything formally, especially if we are working over another field, let's say a finite field of characteristic P. Okay, But we could also take, instead of O, this ring, we could also take uh, or meromorphic functions formal Laurent series or if you want Puiseux series. So there is a kind of flexibility where we want to work. But just think of holomorphic functions nearby 0, and then we are fine. Occasionally, all our examples will essentially have even polynomial coefficients to simplify the writing. Okay. So this will be, O will be our ring of coefficients. And in principle, we would also like to find our solutions inside O, but this will be not possible in general. So <coughs> will be enlarged when we look for solutions of our differential equations. And we will describe how we enlarge it. Okay? So this O is a k-algebra, so sometimes I write k for C or any other field. Okay, this is a, the constants here. We call it the constants. And uh, we will consider O not just as a ring, but as a k-algebra. Whenever we want to use it. And then we define a derivation. 
So let me maybe denote it D from O to O is called a K derivation. If it is K linear plus Leibniz rule or product rule, so D, my elements in the ring O will always be F, G, and H. F, G is D, F times G plus F, D, G. Very well known formula. Okay. That's a derivation. Now, of course, we have, uh, in the special situation where O is just the polynomial ring, or you can even take, yeah, let's take the, formal, the polynomial ring for the moment, then all derivations are of the form d equals a of x, a polynomial times del, which is also a of x derivative with respect to x. That's easy to prove, so where, of course, del applied to x is 1. This is just due to the fact that x, uh, the de derivation is determined, d is determined by the value d of x. Now, if you want to do this for the ring of convergence or formal power series, that's more subtle. And it's actually, it's not completely clear if all derivations look like this without putting a suitable topology on O. So question <coughs> or exercise characterize all derivations, k derivations as always, of cx or cx. They should be, of course, these will be again candidates, but there could be, in principle, more. It's a little bit delicate, but we don't need this. OK, so we get <coughs> their ko. This will be d from o to o the k derivations. This is, of course, now, as we can multiply with functions, this will be an O module. Of course, all these concepts extend to several variables, but we don't need it today and in this class. This is an O module, and actually it is also a Lie algebra. Becomes Lie algebra with the bracket So when you, as d, a derivation is a map from O to O, you may compose two derivations. Now, the composition of two derivations is no longer a derivation, as is easily seen. But you can take the bracket, which is defined as follows, d, e, you compose d with e, and then in the opposite, e composed with d. And this is, again, a derivation. It is easy to prove, and the, the, yeah, you just check it, because the, in principle, the composition would give you second order derivatives, but they cancel because they commute. Okay? So this is, again, a derivation. Uh, but we are interested not just in derivations. We are interested in differential operators. So. Uh, let me write, just to keep the notation, I will write d from O to O for, <coughs> as I said before, the usual derivative without multiplying. Okay, And then we will denote, that's a kind of standard donation, delta from O to O. Delta will be x times del. So this we call it del, and this we call it delta. And this is also called the logarithmic derivative. 
logarithmic derivative. Now, you don't see a logarithm here, but you see the logarithm appear when you interpret this as a dual of logarithmic differential forms. And these differential forms will have poles, and that's why they are often called logarithmic. Okay. So sometimes it's also called maybe Euler differentiation, this del. OK, any questions so far? I think this is, all this is quite clear. I have to profit off my space on the blackboard, so I write just everywhere where I can. So now we consider for k in n, we also have the k-fold composition del composed del, k-fold composition. And that's our first example of a differential operator. This is a differential operator, if you want, by definition. A very simple one. It's just the k-fold derivation. But we will define differential operators in a moment, a little bit in a more general way. OK. So this will be an object which will <coughs> interfere constantly. OK. So once we have this derivation, we may also define, just for completeness, the while algebra, while algebra which has sometimes a special letter, but I will just denote it like this, C x del. So the elements here will be linear combinations of our del to the k. So let me write it L. So here I consider, or usually the Weyl algebra is only considered with polynomial coefficients, differential operators with polynomial. We could, in principle, also take holomorphic functions, but Maybe then you do give it a different name. So here the elements will be <coughs> an of x del n plus an minus 1 x del n minus n plus. Uh, this will appear several times, x del plus a0 of x. Now, I already defined the composition of del. When I write here a0 of x, I want to have this L act on O, so <coughs> L acts on O, so we have a map O to O, and uh, F goes to LF. Now, you just apply the derivatives, but this A0x, this means that you multiply F. So this is induces multiplication. If you want, it is a, a derivative of order 0. Okay. Now, you can see this as a non-commutative ring. If you want, you can see this as x del as, I don't know how to write this. Uh, let me write it like this, x, t. But this is now non-commutative polynomial ring. And then you have the obvious relation, which is given by the Leibniz rule, that <coughs> tx equals 1 plus xt. OK, so x here means multiplication. And you do it when you act on O, it means multiplication by x and t corresponds to the derivative. OK? If you want to see it more algebraically, but we don't need it. We just look at differential operators per se. OK? OK, so this is, of course, if I call this a differential operator of order n, so L, differential operator of order n with coefficients. And now I take again O, any of these rings. 
then it is just a description of the elements. You can also give a more intrinsic definition. Uh, so maybe I write, and this is often called the definition in the sense of Grotendieck. So L from O to O differ is called a differential operator in the sense in the sense of Grotendieck, even though this is a very natural definition which I think already existed before, uh, <clears throat> you define it called the different of order n. So the order always refers to the highest occurring derivative. So if I say here this one has order n, I mean that an is not identically 0, of course. So we define it recursively if for n equals 0, now in case n equals 0, you just assume that L is O linear. But as you have uh, just O itself, this means L is a multiplication. Maybe I write mu times g, g in O, multiplication. with g. So please stop me if I'm going too fast, but I think all this is most uh, quite well known to everybody. So in case you need more information, just let me know. And now for n positive, you define it recursively. Uh, you require that similar as for the derivations require that now for all f in O, if you take L composed with mu f and then mu f composed with L, and I also write this as just L composed with f minus f composed with L, but you have to make sure to understand that this is the composition. Yeah, and f acts by multiplication. And this, now if you do this as before, the order n term will cancel, and you require that this is a differential operator of order n minus 1. Is a diff op of order. Maybe I should say less than or equal n minus 1. Okay. So that's just a direct generalization of the concept of derivation. Fine. So nevertheless, I want to do a small example for fun, and also because it's quite instructive. By the way, one can also define a concept of differential operators of infinite order, what I'm not going to do, of course, to call it. Example, just to get used to it, let us check L equals del square. Now let us check this property. So is a diff op of order 2. So let f g be in O. f will be the one I multiply, and g is the one where I apply the operator. So we get L composed with f minus f composed with L applied to g. Of course, this is a trivial computation, but we do it a little bit at least. So we'll f f times g minus f l g. So maybe I put a dot here. So this is just, I hope you can distinguish my dots and my, my circles. This is a circle, and this is by definition a circle. OK? So here, now we get d squared f times g 
minus f d squared g. Behind, we are done. And here you will see now, I, I think I abbreviate a little bit. What you get is d squared f times g plus 2 times df. This is his form, famous formula, df dg plus f d squared g minus f d squared g, which cancel as we expected. And then you see that in g, now these are these are now the coefficients. This one is also a coefficient because f is fixed. And when you apply it to g, this is now operator, operator of order 1. Uh, less than 1, because if f would be a constant, then you get here even order 0. Okay, So of course, you can extend this to higher order, but you see how things are going. Perfect. So I have given you two definitions of differential operator, so a small exercise show that the two definitions of diff op coincide. So we have one axiomatic, which is the second one, and the other one is by construction. By the way, before I forget, uh, note, so I will distribute exercises every week. And I hope that you look at them at least. And maybe you even think a little bit about them or you try to solve them. They should be fun and also help you to understand the material. And they have a the special effect of exercises or doing exercises is that you keep easier within the class. Now, in an online class, it's very easy to drop out. And if you do the exercises, you get kind of used to, to be closer to the material. So we will do a discussion session. Discussion session. Or problem session with two of with my two PhD students. So this will be Florian and Sergey. So this will not be on the light board, but just by Zoom. I will send an email for the announcement as well. By Zoom, the same link on Mondays at 5 PM. So I hope that you are interested in, in listening to this discussion. You can also, of course, you are invited to present your solutions. You are invited to ask questions. And so you will get some background information and more details. Okay, So we will try it. If there are just two people coming to the discussion session, aside from Florian and Sergey, then we will stop it. But maybe you find time to drop by. Okay. Yes. I have a question about the second definition of differential operator. Because um, we didn't, so for example, our L equals L squared, the differential operator is a differential operator of order 2. Yes. But because we require that the L mu F minus mu of L is a differential operator of order small equal N minus 1, it would also be a differential operator of order 3. Yeah. So what remains is 1, which is smaller or equal to 2. Yes, you are right. So we would have to require some, and n is the maximal or minimal n such that I'm yes. not sure which one it is right now. But you are perfectly right. But when I wrote this down, I was aware that I'm cheating a little bit here. And I hope that nobody will mention it, observe it. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so this one. Let us go it here. <laughs> no? Maybe you have to define a differential operator of order 
less than n, no? Something like this. Okay? It's, it's just, a, I mean, not a matter of mathematics, but a matter of definition. Yeah, I think you have to take less than n. Okay? Thank you, Chiara. Okay, <clears throat> so now we will, we will define uh, special operators, namely, we will expand, we will do a kind of Taylor expansion of our operators, so we use that our coefficients are power series. So let me <clears throat> introduce a bit of notation. If <clears throat> L is some AI of x del i, i from 0 to n, then we can write, assume that the AI are polynomials or holomorphic functions or Meromorphic functions, we can take a power series expansion, so we can write ai of x as, how do I want to write it? No, I want to call it an aj for reasons which will become clear, sorry. aj of x will be cij x to the i, i from 0 to infinity, convergent or not, we don't mind. And the Cij are constants, Cij in K or in the complex numbers. Okay. So we get L equals J 0 to N, I from 0 to infinity, Cij Xi del J. And now if you look here, if you apply Xi del J, to a monomial x to the k, this will go to x to the k plus i minus j. So we order here now the summons according to the difference i minus j. So let me write this like this, s in z. This will be a finite sum, but <coughs> sorry, it's not necessarily a finite sum. You take s in z, and now you take i minus j equals s. Cij xi del j. Okay. So this here, all the differences are the same as this is called to be an Euler operator. So I don't write it down. Euler operator means that the monomials in x and the monomials in del have always constant difference in the exponents, Euler operator of shift i minus j equals s. So this corresponds to a filtration to, of the ring of differential operators, also called the V filtration, but we don't need it. So this will be, of course, there will not be infinitely negative s, but it could start so maybe you could take here, if you want, you could take s in s naught plus n s naught in z, okay? Because in del, we are just polynomial, okay? So <clears throat> you may write this also as L0 plus L1 and so on, where L0 will have shift as 0, L, S1, and so on. You order, you decompose your operator in, let's say, homogeneous terms of same shift. And you order them increasingly. Now, this will depend on the coordinates, of course. We are still, I did not tell you what x is. For the moment, it's just a variable, and we work always with this x, but we will have all the coordinate changes to consider later on. So these are here increasingly ordered. And L0, L this is a term or the operator with minimal shift, is called 
the initial form of L at zero. So this expansion here, especially in x here, this is the power series expansion expansion at zero. Huh? Because you see, if we would like to look at our differential operator at a different point, we would have to take here x minus the point. But to simplify, we will always assume that we look at the origin. Okay? But we have to refer, when we define the initial form, to the point where we are looking at. Okay? And the philosophy of the first part of this class will be that L0 is a kind of dominant term of L. Okay? So this will come soon, but not today, later. L0 is a dominant operator. And what does this mean? It is, say, a rather good approximation of L. So of course, I assume that L0 is non-zero. Now, this rather good here, again, in quotation marks, has to be specified. It depends whether you have a regular singularity or not. But we will make it precise and clear later on. Okay? So this already suggests that the trying to solve a differential equation is a perturbation problem. Now you solve the differential equation given by L0, y equals 0. You solve this one. This is easier because L0 is an Euler operator, and you can describe the solutions explicitly. And then you lift these solutions to a solution of L, y equals 0. Okay? That's something which appears over and over in mathematics, that you approximate complicated things by simpler ones. You solve the equations given by the simpler ones, and then you lift your solutions. Okay. So now this first shift, the smallest shift here, it could be negative. But if I want to solve L y equals 0, I can always multiply L with the power of x, either positive or negative, to make this as 0 equal to 0. So remark, multiplying L y equals 0 with x to the k, some k in z, may assume that S0, which will be called the shift of of L0, but we also call it the shift of L because it is the most important shift, shift of L. But now at 0, equals 0. So now my, my stick is fading out. I hope I have another one. Let's see. So what does this mean? Hence. Hence, may assume that when you apply this L0 to a monomial x to the k, then you get a constant here, which we will determine, times x to the k. It sends monomials, uh, oil, I said this already last week, an oil operator sends monomials to monomials. And if the shift is 0, then it is the same degree monomial. So preserves monomials. Very simple fact. So of course, what we do today is nothing deep. 
but we try to be very systematic. So later on, this will simplify our proofs and arguments. Okay. Now, uh, aside from L0, we will also define the initial polynomial. This is also a very classical object. So let me write again L equals L0 plus and so on. Everything at 0. Then I use the notation which I have here. So we would like to know this factor here, which appears. And it will depend on k, then uh, chi of k. So this is now, or maybe let me write it chi of t to emphasize that they are treated as a variable. The polynomial in one variable with coefficients in our field k with L0 x to the k equals chi of k <coughs> x to the k is called the initial or characteristic. I think I already defined it also last week, characteristic polynomial of L at 0. So either I say of L0, then I don't have to say at 0, or I specify the point. Now, it's not hard to compute this. If you have this description of your operator, this is an easy exercise. But you should do it. So chi of t will be. You take, now I assume already that the, this, this shift as 0 is 0. So we will take CII, -I, and then we take TI lower factorial, where TI is T times T minus 1 up to T minus I plus 1 falling factorial. It's also called Pochhammer symbol. It's immediate to check. And you, <clears throat> yes. So we have this key property here, which tells us that differential equations where we just have an Euler operator are simple to solve. And this is already the first proposition. If k in z is a root of chi of t. So sometimes I write, instead of chi, I, I also write chi sub l of t, chi l 0 of t. Then x to the k is a solution. To L0, y equals 0. Obvious, no? But as you immediately observe, this polynomial chi of t, it has no reason to have integer roots. So the remark will be if, let me write now rho. In, we take the algebraic closure of our field k. Let's say c, if it is, uh, the field is c. If rho in k is a root of chi, not in z, then we have to define a more general solution. Then x to the rho, and now how do we define it? We take exp of <clears throat> rho times log x. This makes sense. Then is, again, a solution of L0y 
equals zero. Okay. So whenever you have high a polynomial of degree n, assume that L0 has degree n. Okay. If L0 has degree n, then chi has also degree n in T, and it will have n roots, but counted with multiplicities. No? So if all these roots are different, then you will get n solutions. So if all roots of chi of L0 are distinct, we get n equals order of L0 many solutions. I'm still in the case of Euler equations, sorry, of L0 y equals 0. Now we will see a little bit later that we can have at most n linearly independent solutions. So this will already be a basis over the ground field k. Yeah. Uh, one thing, our arbitrary operator had order n. And here I assume that L0 has order n. This need not be the same n. In general, L0 could have an order, which means the highest derivative, which has smaller order than L. Yeah? But as we will see later on, the most interesting case, and this is a case which was considered by Fuchs, occurs when the initial form L0, or the initial operator L0 of L, at the point that we are looking at, we are looking locally, so at the point 0, if this operator L0 has the same order of differentiation as L does, this is then what is called a regular singularity. And in this case, the theory of solutions is particularly nice. But one thing you already observe here, even without talking about uh, this regularity, whenever rho is not an integer, you will have to accept monomials with exponents which could be complex numbers, arbitrary complex numbers, or in the algebraic closure of a finite field, or I don't know where. Okay? So this is already the first stage where we have to enlarge our ring O of functions. It's not sufficient to look for solutions there. It is clear that we have to allow this type of monomials. I also call it a monomial, but it has now a kind of strange exponent because it will be a complex number, typically. OK? So how are we going with time? Maybe that's a good moment to have a short break of five minutes, and then we resume. So I can erase everything quietly, and we meet in five minutes. OK, I think we can resume. So let me, before I do an example on this, let me fix this by notation. So definition. L equals L0 plus L1 and so on at 0. And chi equals chi of L0. And I also write it chi of L initial polynomial of L at 0. So the initial polynomial only refers to L0. It doesn't look at the higher order components of L, then the roots of chi in k bar are called the local exponents of L at 0. So Usually, I will use Greek letter denoted by rho 
sigma, and so on. K bar. These are the famous local exponents. Sometimes they are also called characteristic exponents. There's something in the chat. No, oh, OK. Fine. Let me, let me do an example, simple example, but just so that you get a feeling. So we take example which we had in the first class and in the trailer, 2xy prime plus 2y equals 0. So now, here, uh, you can rewrite this. This is something which holds in general. So note. L can also be written as a linear combination of the operators delta, which are x times del. So <clears throat> now you would get L equals of course, you, this may introduce denominators, but you don't care. You take the quotient field of O. So this will then be, let me write it like this. Uh, let me do it for L0. It's just relevant for L0. Then it turns out that this will be Ci tilde delta to the i. And now, <coughs> So let me write here, L0. L0 always means uh, Euler operator. Now these coefficients are even constants in the ground field. Yeah? And then once you rewrite this, and I leave it as an exercise to find the Ci tilde in terms of the Ci, or the Cij, then the chi of L0 will be Ci tilde. <clears throat> t to the i. So that's also classical to rewrite your operator in terms of these deltas. And then, as it is an Euler operator, you will get, here you have i equals 0 to n. You will get constant coefficients. That's one definition of Euler operator. And you get the indicial polynomial like this. And let's do it for the example. So this is the end of the note. Now, here we get here, in the example, we have L equals x squared v2 minus 2x del plus 2. So you see, shift 0, 2 minus 2, 1 minus 1, and 0 gives shift 0. This is, uh, I just write it L, but this is Euler. OK, and <clears throat> now as we rewrite it in terms of delta, a little computation. And I ask you to do it at least once so you are familiar. L, <clears throat> you will get the following description. Delta square minus 3 delta plus 2. That's the same operator, but written in a different basis, if you want. And now you can read off chi of t. We had this already. This will be t squared minus 3t plus 2 equals t minus 1, t minus 2. So here we have integer roots. Rho equals 1, sigma equals 2 integer local exponents, and the solutions are y1 equals x1, y2 x square of ly equals 0. So that's very nice. I mean, it's, it's completely obvious, but it's nice. It works out well. No? 
So exercise, a little small exercise in combinatorics, determine the transformation matrix between the dels and the deltas, del square n and delta, delta square. Of course, it will have variable coefficients, but the matrix is invertible if you look at it in, over the field of meromorphic functions. Okay, Not very hard to show. So before we go on, a couple of remarks. Remarks. Everything still very simple. We are in the warm-up round, uh, as in Formula 1. If A in K is a point different 0, we can do the same story at A, replace x by x plus A, keep del. So if you do just a translation, the derivation will stay the same. But you have to rewrite your operator and get expansion of L at x equals a, and then you also get chi. Now you should maybe write somewhere a l to indicate that now you are at a and the local exponents. That's a, it's not a funny computation, so I skip it in examples. B, the other case is that you take Usually, you work over the projective lines. This was classically the case. So if A is infinity, then replace x in your differential operator by 1 over x. And now you have also to replace del by minus 1 over x squared del. And then look at x equals 0 again. So why do we have to change here also the operator del? The reason is very simple. If you take del and you replace <coughs> in a certain function x by 1 over x, you get from the inner derivative 1 over x squared del f. 1 over x. Okay, so that's why you also have to change the operator. And this can be done more generally if phi, and now we take projective space over k. If here you have a Möbius transformation, an automorphism of p1k of the projective line. So Möbius transformation are these fractional linear transformations. So phi of z is az plus b. You have seen this, cz plus d, where a, b, c, d is an invertible matrix in GL2. Then you can also replace x by may replace in L x by phi of x and del by del of phi times del. Okay. So this is also called the pullback, rational pullback, or birational pullback of L. 
We don't really need it, but for completeness, I want to add these, these definitions. Okay. Okay. So I want to. I wanted to do today at least one non-trivial result. So I have to. What about the time? It's six o'clock. I have half an hour. Yeah. I hope that I can prove at least one interesting result, which is also classical, but let's see. But before doing so, we need a little bit more of definitions. OK. Now we are going to define our different types of singularities. Definition L is always, I just write Ai of x del i in O del. And we take a point, <coughs> let's say, 0. So let's assume that order of L is n, the highest appearing derivative is order n, and 0 in P1k, and this shall indicate that 0 is just any point, but we are strict to 0 to simplify our life, is non-singular for L or Ly equals 0, if and only if. Now, L will have this expansion. I goes from 0 to, in, to n, sorry. This is an n. It is a non-singular point, and less interesting if ai of 0 is non-zero, which means that you can, sorry, an, the highest, the leading curve. This is, does not work. Sorry. So again, a n at 0 is non-zero, which means <coughs> that you can divide the whole operator by a n. But this is not completely correct, because the precise condition would be if you take a and minus 1 x, <coughs> if you divide, because you could have cancellations, a0 of x, a n of x has no pole at 0. Okay, So this means that the order of vanishing at 0 of the numerators a n minus 1 up to a 0 is at least as large as the order of vanishing of a n. Okay. So I usually write like this, but that's not precise because you could have here, you could multiply your L by x, and then it's still non-singular, but this condition will be hurted, whereas this is invariant under multiplication of L by monomials. Okay? Has no pole at zero. So in this case, you are in the classical context of cauchy kovalevskaya and uh, a complete theory of solutions. I will recall the theorem of cauchy kovalevskaya in a moment. So otherwise, 0 is called a singularity of L. And that's the exciting case. And I hope to transmit to you <laughs> this excitement that there's really something happening which is interesting. And we are still just in one variable. The concept of singularities, of course, exists also in several variables, but there the theory is quite incomplete. So 0 is a regular singularity. So. Usually, in, the in many textbooks, you find 
the definition of regular singularity by talking about the orders, comparing the orders here of these fractions. That's not the original definition of Fuchs. Fuchs defined regular singularities by means of the solutions. <coughs> basis, there exists a basis of, let me call it moderate solutions of Ly equals zero locally at zero. The moderate, uh, if you read uh, Frobenius, Frobenius formulated like this. A solution is moderate, I say it first in German, then man is mit einer Potenz von x multipliziert, bleibt die Lösung endlich. So, if you multiply your solution with the power of x, and the power could be also negative, then the solution remains bounded when you approach zero. This has to be made a little bit more precise. We have to work in sectors and so on, but at that time, this was sufficiently precise. And uh, so typically, a logarithm, which we'll see in a moment, will be if a logarithm or a power of a logarithm appears in a solution, this is still moderate. Okay? Whereas if you have a solution which has an essential singularity at zero, then this is not allowed. Okay? So zero irregular singularity <clears throat> some solution. Let me express it poetically, explodes at zero. Which means that you will have a kind of ex essential singularity of the expansion of the function. Okay. We will come, of course, we will come back again to this over and over. Now, let me formulate the theorem of cauchy kovalevskaya And I do it in the holomorphic setting. Maybe you have seen it just in the real setting for differentiable functions. So if L y equals 0 has no singularity at 0, then it admits a basis. Of, and when I say C, here we are over the complex numbers. In the holomorphic setting, classically, it needs a C basis of holomorphic solutions at 0. This is Cauchy Kovalevskaya. Kovalevskaya. OK, so no logarithms appear, and everything is holomorphic. So when I write here at 0, then in general, you assume here to take a simply connected neighborhood. Yeah. Simply connected is necessary because you may have, if you, if you miss a point and you have a loop, yeah, then you may get monodromy, but we don't need this at this moment. So to prove this, so here we have an order n operator. Uh, and usually it is not formulated in terms of operators of order n, but for first order differential equations. But you allow systems. So pass on to a linear first order system. I have already sketched this the last time. So <clears throat> if L, as before, is Aix del i, then you define Al. 
you take an n by n matrix, one, one, and here you take b, one up to b n. This will be in m n o. So, <clears throat> sorry for being a little bit imprecise. Sometimes I have to take here not O, but the quotient field, so meromorphic functions. So better, I should better write here M and M. M will denote the meromorphic functions. Okay. And the BI are precisely the terms we had here. The BI are AI divided by AN minus. Okay. So this AL is called the companion matrix. of L, and then we get a system Let I repeat a little bit from what I did last time, but it doesn't, doesn't do any damage. You take the column vector of now capital variables y1 up to yn, and we get y prime equals a of x, a l of x times y. This is our system, and you pass over from your scalar. This is, will be Ly. This is also called a scalar equation. Can you read? Oh, you cannot see it. Let me write it here. Scalar equation. OK. And this is a system. This is the first order. Above, you have nth order. And the relation is as follows. Uh, the y1 will correspond, this is my sign for correspondence, will be y, y2 will be correspond to y prime, and y n minus 1 will correspond to y n minus 1. And as you de differentiate capital Y, you will get an nth order derivative of small y. Okay. So then you solve, you solve the system here. You solve this now using, let's say, the cauchy kovalevskaya for systems of first order, and then you go back. So solve y prime equals a l of x y, and go back to l y equals 0. Shouldn't it be a capital Y n minus 1? Shouldn't it be a capital Yn if we have n minus 1 derivative of small y? I have never seen here a minus 1. Thank you. Oh, right. <laughs> Must have imagined. Yes, let's do like it was never there. OK. So I am not going to, to prove the existence of a solution of a system. We will later on, we will, prove, we will solve Ly equals 0 directly, also for singularities, with all details. So I can skip here the proof and the further details. OK? Now, this implies, with a little bit of afterthought, that if you are in a singular point, now, the singular points are isolated. Let me repeat. If you are now at a singular point of your scalar differential equation, then I claim that you can have at most n, let's say, holomorphic solutions. Because if you take these solutions at a singular point, you could look at them as they should be defined in a neighborhood. You can look at them at a point outside. Outside, there is no singularity if you are close enough to your singular point. So cauchy kovalevskaya applies, and there you can only have at precisely n solutions. So if you would have more than n solutions at the singular point, you would get a contradiction. So let me write this down. This implies that there can be at most 
and linearly independent solutions y1 up to yn in some suitable function space. We have already seen that O itself, the holomorphic functions, won't suffice. We will have to look at logarithms at least. There can be at most n linearly independent solutions over the complex numbers, y1 up to yn, at a singular point. OK, so we have an upper bound. And the goal will be to show that we will have, we can define a function space where we have exactly a basis with n elements. So goal, define a suitable function space f where we have precisely n linearly independent solutions. And this will be not immediate. Yeah, it is true. It is when you have a regular singularity, the function space is easier, and it is easier to prove. But it is also true uh, for irregular singularities. But then you have to allow kind of more pathological function spaces. Okay. So this is a program of the first, let's say, next week and in, in the session afterwards. OK, so I have a little bit of time left. And uh, I'm not sure if I can prove it, but at least I let, let me write down the famous Ronsky lemma. So this is a lemma everybody of us could have invented herself or himself. So Ronsky was a Polish mathematician from 1776 up to 1853. <clears throat> so he is known for this lemma. Uh, let y1 up to yn be in O. Let me write y for the vector in O to the n. <clears throat> and we form the following matrix, which is Wy, which is called the Ronskian of y1 up to yn. So we take y1, yn in the first row, y1 prime, yn prime. And we go up to the differentiation n minus 1, and n minus 1. So this is now an n by n matrix with entries holomorphic functions, or meromorphic functions. I don't care. This is a Ronsky matrix, or just Ronskyan, Ronsky matrix. Its determinant is often called the Ronskyan. And then y1 up to y n, actually I don't need this definition here, but it doesn't matter, are c linearly independent if and only if the determinant of w y is non-zero. So it is invertible locally at 0. So I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe we still prove it. If you still have a little bit of energy, we are almost, it's not very long. It's tricky. But we can do it, and then we will stop for today. Proof. So one direction is, of course, easy. This one is OK. 
Because if you have a, a linear relation between y1 up to yn, no, it's the opposite direction. Sorry, because I formulated it differently. If y1 up to yn are linearly dependent over the complex numbers, then w of y is trivially 0. I mean, the determinant is 0 because you have linearly dependent rows okay, or columns. So this one, so I assume that the determinant of w is 0, and we have to prove that they are linearly dependent. So without loss of generality, the proof is quite tricky. We can assume that y1 up to yn minus 1 are linearly independent, because otherwise it would be already done. Okay. So we apply induction on n, and we can assume that we get by the lemma in case n minus 1 that the determinant of y tilde is non-zero, where y tilde is now y1 up to y n minus 1. So this would be this w y tilde is an n minus 1 times n minus 1 matrix. But now we can expand the determinant of uh, wy, expand, w, expand the debt of wy along, I don't know how you call this, <clears throat> along rows and get that the last row, y1 n minus 1 up to y n n minus 1 is an O linear combination of the first n minus 1 rows. Now, hence, we get, we get, as we have here order n minus 1, we get a differential equation. We get L yi equals 0 for all yi differential equation of order n minus 1. It's really nice, this proof. L will be an operator with coefficients in O. But now we know that the basis here has length at most n minus 1, because we are in order n minus 1. Basis of solutions of Ly equals 0 has length at most n minus 1. So we have, but we have n elements. Therefore, y1 up to yn must be c linearly dependent. Think about it. I think it's it's not my proof, of course, but it's it's nice. Okay. So. I have a couple more examples, but we don't insist today. So this was kind of systematic uh, description of items, concepts we will need. And next time, I will already start the theory how to solve scalar differential equations of order n at singular points. And for this, we will profit of this idea to approximate an arbitrary differential operator L by its initial form L0. And then we will solve L0 y equals 0. And then I will show you how you lift the solutions to a solution of L of y. 
equals zero. Okay, so that's all for today. Thank you very much for listening and have a wonderful evening or if you are abroad, a wonderful day. Bye-bye. <laughs>